Hello there, we're back. And today we're going to be um, talking about the exciting role of the nurse actually in the labor and birth period. Um, you're following along with the course that I'm teaching in um, this fall. And a couple of things, remember I am just highlighting the major points, probably still should open your book, take a look in there. Secondly, if you can answer the questions that are in the guided note taking that are in the notes below this video, then you have a pretty good um, grasp of the concepts. I'm combining multiple chapters into one lecture. These lectures end up being about an hour long. I am working on um, some 15 minute, very short and click review type videos for each chapter, but my voice isn't gonna hold out. I've been doing a lot of videos this week. So um, they may be coming in the next few weeks. And then lastly, I am um, working on a guided case study to build that clinical judgment. And if you come back to the same playlist, you'll see we're, uh, after you get through this portion of the course, you'll get through this module, module three, then you will be ready to start working through that case study. And I'm going to be um, breaking that up into chunks. And again, just come back to this um, playlist and you'll be able to follow along. Okay, let's get started. So as a nurse caring for a laboring woman, um, we have lots of things that are uh, part of our responsibility. All of the things you see on the screen are really um, part of our role. It becomes a very multifaceted role. We're there to offer comfort measures, both non-pharmacological and pharmacological. We're there to assess both the admission assessment and ongoing assessment. There's education that goes throughout the entire process, um, uh, um, anticipated guidance, what to expect uh, and where we are going to go next. There might be intervention. We are legally responsible um, and morally responsible to intervene if we see a problem. And our clinical judgment is early recognition of that problem. We're there to advocate for what the uh, patient and the, her family desires, and we're the eyes and ears of the physician or the midwife. Most of the time, the laboring nurse is at the bedside, and the physician or midwife are coming and going um, in and out of the bedside, and we are in contact by phone. And of course, we're there to support the partner and any other family members that might be present. So what is it that starts labor? Well, it's kind of a combination of things. Why does labor begin? because all of these influences are um, happening within the body. There's a uterine stretch, it's usually based on the size of the uterus, which might account for why sometimes large um, uterus, a, a uterus that is large because it has more than one baby in it, those babies come early. Um, there's a progesterone withdrawal that happens, increased oxytocin, which is the um, natural hormone in the body, um, that causes uterine contractions. There's an increased sensitivity to that. And there's a release of prostaglandins as that baby presses down on the cervix and that starts to thin, efface, and dilate. So this is just a picture of this uh, feedback loop where all of these items are happening. So there's some signs that labor is coming. One of them is that cervix, as I mentioned, starts to soften. And I have a cervix right here that I'll show you. So this is a uterus up top. And then you can imagine the baby being inside here. And then the cervix is this part down at the bottom. And it's typically very closed um, throughout the pregnancy. And it's going to slowly thin out, soften, and open. And those are signs that labor is coming. Another one is called lightening. That's the medical term for it. And that's when this baby really starts to settle down into that pelvis. And sometimes you hear people say, oh, your baby's dropped. Well, that's what um, we're talking about. There might be um, some bursts of energy. We might have a little bit of bloody show. This is uh, wiping, seeing some bloody mucus on the toilet paper when you're wiping, not bright red blood running down the leg, that would be another problem. We might have some Braxton Hicks contractions, those early contractions um, that start to get that cervix ripe and ready. And sometimes, not, uh, not very often, but there is a rupture of membranes, which is that sac that holds the fluid 
surrounding the baby. So let's talk about contractions for a minute. Um, the, the, the book talks a lot about true versus false labor, and I really hate the term false labor. Every contraction is doing something. And as we go throughout our pregnancy, as I mentioned before, the uterus becomes more sensitive to the oxytocin. And so those contractions can get stronger. The uterus is a muscle and those muscle fibers are going to contract. And that, that contraction of those muscle fibers are going to push the baby down against the opening. And it's almost like a turtleneck sweater. It, it, there's a contraction and a release, contraction and release, contraction and release. And over a period of time, eventually this is going to be open enough that the baby can come through. So a contraction, um, you start to time them from the beginning of the contraction to the end of the contraction. And that is what we call duration. That is, that is how long that contraction is lasting. And then from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next contraction is how long, how often they're coming. So we're looking at different things. How long are they lasting and how frequently are they coming? And this just gives us an idea of where we might be in that labor process. It's not um, the end all be all. And, and this is a process. And we're gonna see many times, especially in first time, um, parents where we see this process start up, go on for several hours and then stop. And then maybe a day or two or three days later, it starts up, goes on for several hours and then stops. This is an ongoing process. So as we can go through this lecture, we're going to be talking about the P's of labor, which is going to include all of these things, passageway, passenger, powers, position, psychological response, philosophy, low tech or high tech, the partners, the patient's natural timing of this process. We've been trained by watching what is listed in popular um, media. You know, what we see is that a woman has a contraction and then in the next five minutes, she's screaming, yelling, ready to push her baby out. That's not the way labor happens. That's just the part they show you for um, lots of views, right? patient preparation and pain control. So all of these P's are involved in the labor process. So when we're talking about the pelvis, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. This is the top portion of this pelvis. This is what we call the greater pelvis, but the true pelvis is down here because this is the part that the baby is actually going to fit through, down through here. And so um, sometimes you will see questions asked about true pelvis and um, uh, greater pelvis. Now we think about the pelvis in terms of um, three different levels. And the baby has to really navigate through all of those levels in order to be able to fit through. And here is one of my aha moments. I've had a lot of these as I've been recording these lectures over the last couple of days. So there was an article that came out in 2021 by Van Sickle et al. And they really talked about the different um, pelvis typologies that are currently still in all the medical textbooks, all the nursing textbooks, and even in the nurse midwifery textbooks. And it's based on different pelvis types being more conducive to vaginal delivery or not. And um, unfortunately, this... Um, a perfect obstetric pelvis and the classification system is really based on uh, racist ideology. And so this article really challenged all educators to put this information out there that we need to stop teaching the, the types of pelvis, pelvises. My challenge and a lot of us challenge is that it's still going to be in your national test. It's going to be in your RN test. It's going to be in your uh, midwifery board exams. And so I have to tell you what it is they're looking for until we can do the process of getting this taken out of the textbooks altogether. So when you are talking about um, a pelvis, the, what they're typically looking for is that gynecoid pelvis. That's what they, uh, according to this classification system, is the most favorable for vaginal delivery. But like I said before, in other places, we are only mentioning this 
because you might see it on a national test. We now recognize that lots of different pelvis shapes and sizes can, um, you can have a vaginal delivery through. Lots of uh, factors go into this process. As we continue on talking about the um, passageway, we, we've talked about the cervix. And again, it starts off very thick and closed, very thick like your earlobe. And then by the time it's completely thinned out, it should be as about as thin as this piece of skin between your thumb and forefinger. You also have the pelvic floor muscles and the vagina, just part of the passageway. This is an example of how it starts off very thick and uh, closed, and then it begins to open. And uh, here it's completely thinned out and it is completely thin and open. Uh, what we call complete, or in some parts of the country, they'll call it fully as a abbreviation for fully dilated. So dilation is the opening and the thinning is effacement. So I'd like to refer to something that is familiar to patients. So if I say your cervix is four centimeters dilated, they don't really have a picture of what that looks like. But if I say the cervix is open about as much of a slice of a banana and needs to get to about as open as a slice of a cantaloupe, then they can put that into perspective. When we're doing a vaginal exam, we're actually measuring the thickness and the opening, how open that cervix is. And this is a subjective, uh, uh, sorry, objective exam because um, each person is going to have a little bit different uh, finger width. And so sometimes you'll see some discrepancies between those numbers. Again, this is just a look at uh, how we're measuring the dilation and effacement of the cervix. And we need it to get, you can see, we need it to be open about as wide as I can stretch my fingers so that this baby can fit down through that cervix. Now, if the baby is smaller, it might not need to be as open as much. And the passenger, as we talk about that, we're going to discuss all of the things that you see on the slide here. One of the things that makes humans unique is that we have the ability to take, well, we have a large head at birth and it's partly because we have such a large brain inside of that skull. And one of the um, things that make us uniquely human is that these skull bones are not fused together at birth. And they are able to actually, this baby obviously is hard plastic, but a, a baby is able to mold those bones uh, uh, across each other in order to navigate this pelvis. And the pelvis is actually pretty small and it's designed this way so that we can walk upright. So this baby is going to be able to find the path of least resistance and then between uterine contractions and mother's pushing efforts that it should hopefully be able to mold that skull into a shape that is going to fit through this pelvis. Now some positions are better than others. That's called molding, you definitely wanna know. And this intersection, the space in between where those bones are, are called fontanelles. And that's how, when I'm doing an exam, I can tell sometimes which direction that baby is facing based on which fontanelle I feel. So this is a picture of some pretty severe molding. This should be better in the uh, first 24 hours or so. We are on the lookout for some um, other conditions that can happen. Caput is the swelling underneath the skin that's usually fluid involved. And then um, a, a hematoma, it can also happen. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about newborns. But caput is a normal occurrence. The fetal attitude is the relationship of the baby's body parts um, to one another. And it's called the fetal attitude. So if you look up here at my picture again, this baby really needs to tuck its head in order to start those cardinal movements and get down in that pelvis. And so we call that flexed. You can see if it's deflexed, the widest part of the head, is going to try to fit through the pelvis 
um, rather than the smallest part of the head. If it's extended, it's even more difficult to get that baby down through that pelvis. So that is what we talk about attitude. And these are the different types of attitudes. And this is what it would look like if you were looking head on in the pelvis this direction. The fetal lie is how it is lying in the mother's body. And you can see the longitudinal lie, uh, vertex, head down presentation is the most conducive to a vaginal delivery. Um, breech presentation when it's uh, bottom first, or sometimes even legs are coming first, is also a longitudinal lie. And there, this is a lost art. There are a lot of um, practitioners that don't even learn about breech birth because it's become so commonplace to do a, a cesarean section. But all over the world, babies come out in the breech position um, pretty frequently. And it's only in our Western society that we uh, choose to do cesareans for those births. There is some research that shows there is a slightly less um, uh, morbidity and mortality with uh, a cesarean section for a breech delivery than a vaginal breech delivery. And then obviously this one is not going to fit um, that direction. And it's going to need some help either in getting that baby turned, if it's at all possible, or that baby will need to come through a cesarean incision. Okay. Um, we've talked about all of those. And this is just another picture of what that might look like. Feel free to pause the video and take a look at these pictures. So when we're talking about uh, fetal position, you do not have to memorize this for my course. There are some courses that may want you to memorize this, but we refer to where the baby is in the pelvis um, based on where the occiput is in, uh, in the body. So the occiput is that backbone. This is the occiput of the baby, that's the occiput bone. And so if I am right occiput posterior, right occiput posterior, that baby is actually facing the mother's front. If I'm right occiput anterior or left occiput anterior, I am, my occiput is to the front of the mother. We want babies to be facing this direction. It's the most conducive to getting through that pelvis. But what we want is not always what we get. These babies navigate the pelvis as best as they can, and they come how they come. So um, ROA or LOA, you'll hear those words a lot, or ROP or LOP, that's that baby. You can see, if I turn it this way, if the baby is coming down opposite posterior, OP, what kind of uh, symptoms do you think the mom might have of that compared to OA? If you said backache, you're correct. This is where back labor comes from. So if a woman is complaining her back hurts, her back hurts, her back hurts, there's a good chance that this is what this back of this baby's head is actually being pressed into that back. So I just want you to recognize what those terms are if you hear them. You don't have to memorize them from my course. And then we talk about fetal station. And this is where the baby is in relationship to the ischial spines of the pelvis. So once the baby has gotten to the top of the head, has gotten to those ischial spines, it's navigated quite a bit of this pelvis, you can see. Rather than being up here, it's navigated quite a bit of getting down into this position. So we call that zero station. And then everything past that is considered a positive number. So you can see here, it would be plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. And that just tells us how well this baby is navigating through this narrowest part down here of the um, pelvis. If you hear negative numbers, negative one, negative two, negative three, then that baby has not engaged and has not gotten to the level of the ischial spines. And sometimes it can be a clue if the baby is not coming down that it may not fit. Now we have to give it time, 
but that's one of the things that we do start putting in our back pocket to think, hmm, what's going on? So we like to think about where the baby is in levels. And then as labor nurses, we learn how to help position the mom for the easiest path for the baby to travel the easiest path through that pelvis. What kind of positions do you think might be the best? Do you think laying flat on her back is going to be the best for this baby to try to navigate the pelvis? Or maybe in an upright position with lots of movement to help this baby wiggle its way through. If you sit upright, you're correct. We've talked about Leopold's before. Leopold's is a, um, a stepwise technique to help try to determine where this baby is in the belly. Each woman is going to have a different um, adipose tissue and uh, uh, you know it, it, it may be harder in some people to feel this and it definitely is something that you have to practice. But if you, as a student, get the opportunity to put a fetal monitor on a patient while you're in clinic, be sure and, and do work your ways through and try to figure out where it is that you are, um, what you're feeling and where this baby is. We can sometimes ask the patient, where do you feel the baby kicking? And if she says that she feels the baby kicking down in this area, we're suspicious that maybe that baby is breech. If we find fetal heart tones up in this area, we're suspicious that baby is breech. So this is just another way of trying to determine where this baby is in the belly. Again, you do not have to memorize this for my course. I want you just to recognize these terms, cardinal movements of birth are um, the, the movements, the, the process of this baby getting down through the pelvis. And this is something that um, we memorize uh, uh, to, to know where we are in the process. But as a, as a pre-licensure nursing student, you don't have to memorize it. So now we're on to powers. And this is uterine contractions. That's the primary stimulus and that's involuntary. So those contractions are going to come and go and how effective the contractions are have um, lots of variables to it. How exhausted mom is, how well fed she is, how long this has been going on, how the mom's psyche feels about this process. All of these things can, can interfere with how effective these are if she's frightened. And um, the next part is the intra-abdominal pressure from the mother, which is bearing down, pushing. Again, these are typically involuntary. If she's not numb, there will be a urge that takes over, uh, Ferguson's reflex that takes over, that uh, encourages her to bear down. Now, if she is numb with an epidural, then sometimes she has to be coached through this time. This is what a typical labor room in a hospital situation looks like. This is your fetal monitor. You have two straps here. You have the ultrasound and you have the um, TOCO, which is the TOCO dynamometer. And that is picking up uterine activity and the ultrasound is picking up uh, heart rate activity. And those are gonna correlate over here. The one with heart is the fetal heart rate. And then this is the uterine activity. Now this is just picking up pressure. This external monitor only tells us how often a contraction is happening and how long it lasts. It does not tell us how strong it is. Now, as the nurse, you will palpate with your hand and you will determine with the, um, as you place your, your uh, fingertips, finger, the, the side of your fingers on the top of the fundus, you can feel how strong that contraction is, but this monitor does not tell you. Now we have another kind of monitor that will give us an actual pressure um, uh, number, and that's called an IUPC, interuterine pressure catheter, a different thing. And then you usually have paper and an electronic version of the same print out. All of these are part of the medical record and they're there um, for legal purposes. When we're looking at our uterine activity, we're looking at four different things. Remember frequency, beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next. Duration, how long that contraction is lasting. Intensity, only if you have an internal monitor can you tell the intensity. And relaxation, 
this is the most important part of, of measuring and assessing uterine tone is the relaxation of that uterus because during relaxation is when the spiral arteries of the placenta are able to fill back up with blood and replenish what it's going to send to the fetus. During all the rest of these times, it is clamping down and um, not sending that blood flow to the fetus. So as we continue on with our nursing care during that first stage, we're gonna talk about stages and phases in just a minute, but as we continue our nursing care, we have lots of questions that we're going to be asking. And remember, ask to ask, is it okay if I ask you about um, some of your more private medical history? You wanna make sure that we're doing that away from significant others and any other family members, it is her private information. We're going to get an admission history, we want to look at her prenatal records and her routine lab test. And we're gonna compare those to what we would expect to find because that might determine if we have to do some interventions for this patient right away. We're gonna ask about what type of education she's had. Does she have a birth plan? Does she have a perfect idea of what, um, she wants for this experience. And you can kind of talk about some of the things that she wants compared to what um, is available at that unit or available per policy at, at the facility she's delivering at. And then we're going to be completing a physical assessment. And I know throughout this lecture, I'm saying she and her and woman quite a bit, just for ease of getting through this material in a quick um, timely fashion. I do recognize that um, that's not very inclusive language, and I just want to point that out. So one of the things that we really need to bring back into our um, ideology when we're doing labor triage is, does she really need to be in the hospital at this point? Is she really ready? Is she in an active labor pattern? Does she need to be there? Or does she need to be there even if she's not in an active labor pattern because she needs the support, she needs um, the rest, the therapeutic rest. So we really have to think every woman that walks through the door shouldn't be staying and um, uh, having her labor augmented or encouraged with medication just because. We have to get back to what's best for the individual patient, not large amounts of people that we need to get in and get out. It is not provider convenience. It is for the patient and we, and, and it is not unit convenience. It is for the patient. So this was just um, looking at really encouraging childbirth education for everyone and providing that in a way that's accessible to everyone. So that's probably going to be on the internet or on the app somehow. Uh, looking at an elective induction, has there really been shared decision making with an elective induction? We'll talk more about what an elective induction, induction is in just a minute. And then looking at early labor, we have all the research that says if she is open to it, early labor is best at home, best done at home. Give her the tools to, to support herself in, in what she needs in early labor and let her know good information about when she should come back. And just these three simple steps can reduce our primary cesarean section rate drastically. So our admission history is going to include body systems. We're going to be looking at that bundle height measurement. You can check out previous videos to talk about that. We wanna compare it to what her weeks of gestation are. We're looking at the uterine activity as I just discussed. We wanna know status of membranes. Is that, is she intact? Is she ruptured? And sometimes we don't, it's a little bit hard to tell. And so we have some tools, some testing that we can do that can help us determine if she's ruptured or not. If she is, we want to know the time, the amount of fluid that's come out, the color, and if there's any odor. At some point, we will need to do an initial cervical dilation and degree of effacement uh, uh, assessment. We're going to be looking at our second patient, fetal heart rate, position, station, and then how well is she coping and what is her current pain level? A little bit about pain levels. It, this is um, subjective. It's whatever they say it is. And, and I'll admit this has been a bias of mine. Sometimes I will have patients rate their pain uh, pretty high, seven, eight, while they're calmly sitting, maybe doing something on their phone. But it is not up to me to decide what their pain level is. And that's something that 
that's one of those um, unconscious bias biases that we've been talking about. We've got the, if they say their pain is an eight, then their pain is an eight and we need to treat it and then review how that treatment went. And it may be non-pharmacological treatment at this point, but we still need to address it. So as we go through, uh, I would highly recommend that you stop the video at this point and look at all of these labs. And you need to know what is the expected finding for each of these labs? What is the uh, intervention if you don't have the expected finding? This is, um, these labs are, are, are the same for everyone. So that's one nice thing is you just have a set of labs and you want to spend some time and make sure you really understand them. There's a nice little graph that you can complete in your guided lecture notes. We also are going to be doing some risk assessment, bleeding assessment, um, shoulder dystocia assessment, and preeclampsia assessment. Bleeding is not whether she is at risk for bleeding or not, it's if she's low risk or high risk, because everyone is at risk for bleeding. Shoulder dystocia, low risk or high risk. Preeclampsia, does she have early signs? Does she, uh, is it a potential? And as a nurse, when you're looking at a risk assessment, you're really want, thinking to yourself, what um, interventions do I need to apply right now in order to address these risk assessments? So other factors that influence a positive birth experience, it's kind of an interesting little group of, um, factors here. You want to go through and look. A, a lot of this is emotional and social. It really doesn't have a lot to do with what physically is happening it, for the birth, but factors that influence whether how she feels about it is not really um, how long it was, the degree of pain she had. It was how supported she was. Did she have a sense of mastery? Did she have trust in the staff caring for her? Did she have personal control over her breathing and response to pain? How prepared was she? So it's interesting to me that something that is often thought of the most painful experience in your life is really influenced by things other than physical. This is with the media portrait. You've probably seen all these movies, right? This is what we're used to seeing. And the next few slides are gonna go pretty quickly, but you'll see that it can be completely different in the real world. This is just for media, this is just for views. But in the real world, it can look like this. Calm, supportive, powerful, relaxed, victorious, joyful, overwhelmed, surprised, shocked, a little bit different than what you're used to seeing. And here, this was the uh, picture of the year on Time Magazine, a sibling meeting her new, I can't tell if it's a brother or sister. So I show that to you because what you've been used to seeing in our popular media is not the way birth is. I've seen a thousand deliveries and every one of them has a different emotion to it. They, it there's a large gamut of emotion. And what does that say to the next generation? How are we influencing the next generation by um, the popular media uh, exposure? Just a little food for thought there. So here we have our physiological responses. This is our maternal physiological responses. And so we do see an increased heart rate. We do see increased cardiac output and sometimes blood pressure, especially during contractions. So we don't want to take a blood pressure during contractions because it actually w could be a false reading. We see a slightly increased white blood cell count. Be sure to look at your labs and see how those are different than the ranges you learned for other areas like med surge. We see increased respiratory rate, oxygen consumption, decreased gastric motility. What might happen if we have decreased gastric motility? Yeah, they might vomit. They might throw it back up. They have a slight temperature elevation and decreased blood glucose levels. So why does it make sense that this, she's running a marathon, 
phys physically she's she's working as hard as she's ever worked and we cut off her supply of nutrients. Doesn't make sense, does it? These are some early warning criteria. I just want you to have a, a basis. These are things that would need to be reported right away and that we should be concerned about. The fetus also has some physiological responses to labor. There is a decrease in circulation and perfusion. Sometimes we'll have fetal heart rate accelerations and sometimes we'll see some decelerations. You will learn in your fetal monitoring lecture, which is another video, uh, what those mean, and it is important that you understand the differences between those decelerations because some are benign, one is benign, and the others are not benign and can lead us to think about hypoxia. Um, we see decrease in fetal breathing movement and sometimes decrease in fetal movement altogether. So as we are looking at the fetus, which is our other patient during labor, we are also going to be assessing that amniotic fluid on a regular basis. The initial time when it, when, if it ruptures, we, or if it's uh, uh, artificially ruptured, we are going to assess it, but we need to continuously assess it throughout labor. We're always looking for odor. We're always looking for meconium staining. We are looking at our fetal heart rate monitoring, and that might be done in, with a handheld Doppler or it might be done intermittently, or it might be done continuously. And then we have external, which is the uh, outside TOCO, I'm uh, sorry, it's ultrasound. And then we have internal, which is called a fetal scalp electrode. And this is a little tiny electrode that is placed um, just underneath the skin, and it picks up the heart rate there. And we'll talk more about that when we do our lecture next week. We are looking at our fetal heart rate patterns. Uh, we are always assessing baseline, baseline variability, and periodic changes. Be sure to check out table 14.1 in your book. You also want to, to watch the fetal monitoring video and look at your pocket guide. And then there are some other ways that we can assess. These are not done very um, often, uh, but they are mentioned in your book, so I have them here. So we're looking at a fetal monitor. We have our normal range, which is 110 to 160. And then here is the heart rate. And this is different than what you would see in um, like an EKG. So here you're looking at a, a, a range of time. And so uh, these big red lines equal one minute. The little numbers going across this way, these little boxes equal 10 seconds. The little boxes here equal 10 seconds. And then going up this way, they equal 10 seconds. And going up this way for the um, uterine activity, these equal five. And you can always tell, tell what your scale is by looking over here. You see 60, 70, 80, 90, and here 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. So looking overall, we're looking at baseline, baseline variability, and then periodic changes either above the baseline or below the baseline. And then uh, we've already talked about contraction. So I'm not gonna spend any more time here on fetal monitoring, but you definitely need to spend time. I think that video is 25 minutes or so so that you understand what we're looking at. They do have these questions on NCLEX and they are um, clinical judgment based. Like, what do you do if you see this? So here are the key terms that you'll want to make sure that you understand. What is an acceleration? What is the definition of that? Um, artifact, baseline fetal heart rate, baseline variability, deceleration, electronic fetal monitoring, and baseline uh, periodic baseline changes. We talk in what we call the NICHD terminology. So this is a language that really, um, 2008, I think is when this came about so that everyone is on the same page. And basically what this, when I talk category one, category two, or category three, I'm able to clearly um, explain in a short synopsis of how well oxygenated or how well this baby is tolerating this labor. So if I say this baby is category one, it meets all the criteria that are listed there. And I have no worries. This baby is at this point in time appears to be well oxygenated. If I say this baby is category three, I am very concerned 
and it is likely that this baby is not well oxygenated and that it um, elicits the response of we need to do something. Intervention is needed. Category two is that gray area where there's a good category two and a bad category two. But basically what it's saying is, I don't know, this baby could be well oxygenated or it could not be well oxygenated. And so um, it, it, it's also verbalizing where I stand with this, um, with how I feel about what's going on. And this is how we communicate to providers, provider to provider, uh, nurse to provider, so as I just said, what we're really talking about is at this point in time, can I rule out hypoxia or can I not rule out hypoxia? And so if I have these items, if I have a stable fetal heart rate, if I have moderate variability, if I have accelerations present, if I have contractions that are not lasting more than 120 seconds or not coming closer than every two minutes, I'm reasonably certain of oxygenation. If I have any of these items, I am not uh, certain that this baby is um, oxygenating. So I cannot rule out hypoxia. This is um, an acronym mnemonic that will help you remember what those things mean. It's listed in your fetal monitoring booklet. It's also in your fetal monitoring video, but basically it's looking at those uh, variables away from um, the periodic changes away from the baseline. And so if you have a variable, it is caused by cord compression and it's telling you what they're from. An early deceleration is caused by head compression. An acceleration is okay. And it means that the baby is probably well oxygenated and a late decel is from placental insufficiency. Please make sure you understand what all of these mean. For my course, you will see these on an exam, and most likely you will see this concept on NCLEX as well. So I just want to reiterate, non-reassuring, which is the old term that we used to use, you might see it in some resources, really means we are suspecting developing or worsening hypoxia. So if I have a strip that is non-reassuring, it's not a term we use anymore, but if I have a strip, that um, does not meet the criteria to be a category one, then I am suspecting there could be developing or worsening hypoxia. So here are some guidelines uh, for assessing fetal heart rate. Um, of course, you're always going to follow what your policy is on, at the hospital, but for most places, if a woman is low risk, we can um, be watching every 30 minutes or so some facilities want their patients on continuously, but you're documenting every 30 minutes. And we do want an initial 20 minute continuous strip in the beginning to get a good baseline of where we are. And these are some of the different fetal monitoring patterns. And um, you can see we're looking at our normal range. And this is showing you that we have an acceleration that's above the baseline. And this is your category one. Everything looks good, no one's worried. Here, we have tachycardia. So we already know that we're not gonna be a category one. So that doesn't fit in category one. Here's a fun fact, and you wanna write this down. The number one reason for fetal tachycardia is maternal elevated temperature. So I'll say it again. Number one reason, most common reason for fetal tachycardia is maternal elevated temperature. And what is the common reason for elevated temperature? Sepsis or infection, brewing infection, not sepsis yet. So um, that's one of those, those tips that you wanna put in your pocket. Here we have an example of an early deceleration, an early deceleration that mirrors the contraction, meaning it starts at the same time and ends at the same time as a contraction, and that is from head compression. So really that is from this fetus pressing down into this pelvis and it, that response is from head compression. This is not a break in the oxygen pathway. This is okay. The other types of decelerations, late decelerations or variable decelerations are a break in the oxygen pathway. 
and that could lead to developing or worsening hypoxia. And this is an example of a late deceleration that starts after the peak of that contraction. Again, spend some time in that fetal monitoring video. So here we have a baby that is telling us I need help. We have late decelerations. We have minimal variability. And sometimes you'll see this where they wrote on the strip or they'll type it into the electronic medical record, this is where the Pitocin was turned off. Why do you think that is? Because if we have a medication running that is causing contractions to happen and this baby is not tolerating those contractions, we are legally and ethically and morally responsible to turn that medication off. I don't care who gets mad. I don't care how quickly we're trying to get her delivered. We cannot continue giving a medication that could be causing the hypoxia. Um, continuous electronic fetal monitoring. This is when uh, we are watching it um, continuously. I showed you the monitor a few pages back and its primary objective is to provide information about fetal oxygenation. And it's to detect fetal heart rate changes early before they're prolonged or profound. It is, if we have an electronic fetal monitor on, we are obligated to watch it and inter interpret and intervene if we see something wrong. So this is your third edition book. And the reason why we have a big X through this is because this is one of the changes that were made from the third edition to the fourth edition, thankfully, because we no longer think about these, um, uh, phases as being three different phases of labor. So we have stages of labor, and then we have phases of that first stage. So our stages of labor is the first part is the dilation and effacement of the cervix. That's stage one. Stage two is the complete dilation of the cervix to delivery of the baby. Stage three is fr uh, from um, uh, delivery of the baby to delivery of the placenta, and stage four is recovery. And in that first stage of labor, that dilation and effacement, what we typically refer to as labor is that dilation and effacement of the cervix. We used to talk about three different phases, and I leave this here because you might see it in some of your resources. And is that frustrating to you to see different um, numbers and different reference ranges in your resources? Well, just know that science is always changing and we are always learning and new information is always coming out. So one of the things I've learned in all of my education is that I need to really be open to thinking that maybe something I learned one way is different now it's because we've learned more. And that's what this is about. We don't really spend a lot of time talking about this transition phase anymore. We talk about the latent early phase of labor and the active phase of labor. And we kind of just don't pay attention to this one anymore. Okay, so this is what modern day, this is what your textbook is teaching, is that our latent phase of labor is zero to six centimeters dilated. So it starts off at, at uh, zero or one, like this little card I have here. And remember, it gets all the way to 10, as far as I can stretch my fingers. And so all this first part, we consider latent labor. This is early labor. And then this is active labor, okay? And that might be a little different than what you've heard before, or maybe you've learned it differently. So we're continuing on with our stages of labor. First stage is dilation and effacement of the cervix. Second stage is complete dilation of the cervix to delivery of the baby. Third stage is uh, birth of the infant to placental separation and expulsion. And then the fourth stage is recovery. And that really most intense period of recovery when a lot of physiological processes are changing is that first one to four hours. And we need to be watching this patient very closely during this time. So here's that placenta again. This is the fetal side with the fetal cord. And you can see all that branching of those veins. Remember what's in that fetal cord. We have 
two arteries and a vein. You can remember that AVA. And here's that sac, once again, where the fetus develops. And here's the maternal side. And what are those little pieces called? Cotylons. Good. So signs of placental separation, sometimes the uterus will start to rise upward. They might see a little bit of umbilical cord lengthening. There might be a, a sudden trickle of blood. And then the uterus changes shape. NCLEX loves to ask you what the signs are. We never want to pull the placenta out. It needs to come out naturally. Now, sometimes you will see a little gentle traction to help it come out, um, but they're not pulling it from adhering in the uterus. They're just helping to guide it out of the vagina without the mom having to push, but we don't want to pull it off of the uterus. So factors that affect the process of labor. So we talked before about the emotional part of it, but now the process of labor. Um, this is the position and size of the baby, the presentation of the baby, the size and shape of that mother's pelvis, and the effectiveness of the contractions, how her physical and emotional well-being is, how much support she has by her partner, by her team, and if there's any medications or anesthesia administered. There are several factors that influence pain and you can see them listed here. Somebody who is exhausted or not ready for this process or upset emotionally for another reason is going to have a harder um, time uh, managing her pain. It's a universal experience, pain is. Intensity is highly variable and we, as nurses need to understand the numerous non-pharmacological and pharmacological choices. So starting with our non-pharmacological, continuous labor support has been shown to decrease the perception of pain in labor, decrease the length of time in labor, and increase maternal satisfaction. Imagine that, something so simple, just having someone there with you. Um, hydrotherapy, either a shower or a bath, has been shown to decrease pain. Ambulation and position changes. Some acupuncture, acupressure, focusing, imagery, all that um, Lamaze type breathing that we learned that was really just a distraction technique and mindfulness meditation and therapeutic touch. This is a, a algorithm. I know it's a little hard to see, but you can increase your screen. You can actually even find this online. Um, this is an algorithm to determine if someone is actually coping or not. Because sometimes women are coping, but they say things like, oh, I can't do this, and this is so hard, and I'm, it's so much work, and um, it, I'm in so much pain, but yet they are coping with it. They're just verbalizing it. But sometimes people are not coping, and they might not be saying anything. They might just be crying. They might just be panicked. They might be extremely tense. And so this is an algorithm to help us determine, is someone actually coping or not, and then what we can do about it. If a woman is successfully using a safe, non-pharmacological pain control technique, whatever that may be, do not interfere. I have seen all kinds of rhythm and ritual that women will kind of get into to deal with their pain and whatever is working for them, we let them do. So we're looking at these two pictures, just from the outward appearance, how well do you think she's coping? And what are the signs that tell you she is or is not coping? And how well do you think she's coping? And how can you tell? Learning to recognize those verbal cues. This is a great tool. We call it a birth ball and our exercise ball. It's a fantastic tool to utilize in labor. Most units have figured out that these are great tools and have them available for use. This is called a peanut ball. You see how it's got a little bit of a different shape. It can be used in bed. So someone that is um, it required to have bed rest or maybe someone that's had an epidural can still use a peanut ball. And it can also be used outside of the bed. Here are some breathing patterns. And if you look at these, you can see these are different breathing patterns. You could do another video, a YouTube video on the different breathing patterns. But really what this is, is a distraction technique and mindfulness. What kind of breathing pattern is she using? If you said hyperventilation, you are correct. And here is how we recognize that she's hyperventilating. 
some signs she might uh, mention dizziness, tingling of the hands and feet, cramps or muscle spasms, numbness around the nose or mouth, or if she starts feeling blurry vision, those are signs that she's heading towards passing out. Some ways that we can help her kind of get back into control is uh, breathe with her and slow your breathing way down and have her mimic you. Using your hands to cup around the mouth or having her use her hands to cup around the mouth and breathe into those hands. Using a moist washcloth over the mouth and nose or holding the breath for a few seconds and then exhaling. We want to help her correct this before she actually passes out. Now we're gonna move into our pharmacological tools. We have both systemic analgesia, regional or local and neuraxial. And nitrous oxide is one of those tools also known as laughing gas. You may have heard it referred to that. You may have used it at the dentist. It's a little bit different formulation, but this has been used in Europe for over a hundred years and it's highly effective. It doesn't take away pain, it takes away anxiety, helps them deal with anxiety. You may have heard it referred to as gas and air, that's what they call it. Um, it causes absolutely no effect on the fetus. It's out of the body in seconds. And the only side effect that we, or caution that we have to take is anyone that has a vitamin B12 deficiency. So if they've had a previous gastric bypass and have poor absorption, or if they are a very strict vegan with um, not a very wide variety of diet, then um, they might have a B12 deficiency. Moving on to systemic, this would be another great place to stop this video, get your medication cards out, make sure you absolutely understand the name brand and the generic brand and what the signs and symptoms um, expected are from the use of these medications and maybe even the dose and any um, antidote if necessary. So the opioids that are commonly used are butorphanol or statol, um, nalbuphine or nubane, and fentanyl. And I know fentanyl has got a bad rap, but when it's used medically in these, uh, in you know, specific circumstances like labor, it's very short acting. And it's actually a really um, good drug to use because it's out of the body quicker and doesn't affect uh, the respiratory effort of the fetus as much. Um, side effects could be sleepiness, decreased respirations in the maternal and fetally, you're going to see decreased variability in that heart rate and respiratory depression potentially if it's given close to delivery. And these are typically administered through an existing IV line. When we're talking about regional anesthesia, usually you'll, uh, the most common is epidural block, and that is most often a continuous infusion nowadays with a patient-controlled option for giving a little extra dose. We'll talk more about that in the next slide. We have a local infiltration, which is usually used for an episiotomy or a lacer laceration repair. An old-fashioned um, block, it's called the pudendal block, and it's um, almost always used for second stage delivery or if there's going to be an operative vaginal delivery, if they're gonna use uh, tools like a forceps or a vacuum, you don't see this used very often anymore. And then we have an intrathecal or a spinal, and this is most often used for a cesarean birth. So when you're talking about an epidural, I happen to have an epidural needle right here. I'm gonna to try to show that to you. It's got the the sheath on it here. That is the needle. And it is unique in that it has to have a space in inside the needle. It's called an over the needle catheter so that you can take the needle out and thread the catheter through that space. So it's a little bit um, unique. It goes into the epidura. So above the dura, the dura is that thick covering that covers the spinal cord and it goes into the space right above that. So it does not go into the spinal column. It's above that. And then a thin catheter is threaded through that needle and the needle is removed. And that thin catheter is just underneath the skin and it continuously drips medicine that numbs the area. Numbs usually from about the nipple line down. Now, some people they're, they're wired differently. 
And so some people do have a space, a spot that doesn't get completely numb. And we call that a window and all their labor pain is in one little spot and they aren't very happy about that, but um, there's not really anything that can be done if that's just how they're wired. This is the position most people are sitting in when they get an epidural placement. The nurse is going to help her really relax those shoulders and um, poke out her back like a mad cat to open these spaces because they have to fit through the bones to get into that epidural space. And if she's tense and tight, it makes it harder to get in there. And then that is an example of what it looks like. They do numb the area first. And that's an example of what it looks like before they remove that needle. Now, epidural provides good pain control for most women. There are some side effects to it. Most women experience a vasodilation, which equals decreased blood pressure. Sometimes it can be profound. So our nursing intervention is to give a bolus of IV fluid, either right before or evidence-based practice tells us concurrently when the procedure is happening to counter effect that. We want frequent assessment every two to three minutes after the procedure is done to watch for that decreased blood pressure. And it's possible that the patient may need a vasopressor at, uh, like ephedrine to bring that blood pressure back up um, if it's a profound drop. And then it becomes our job as the nurse to move this mom around just as if she would have been moving had she not been numb. And that is to uh, help this baby navigate that pelvis as best as possible. So that's when we're using those peanut balls and really repositioning every 20 or 30 minutes. The difference between analgesic and anesthetic, an analgesic blocks pain and an anesthetic blocks both pain and motor responses. So an anesthetic would be like a spinal anesthetic. Um, continuing on with our assessments, these are all the things that we need to be looking at and assessing on a very regular basis during our first stage of labor. This is why laboring patients really should be one-to-one, -one, but most places they're not. Um, usually have uh, two-to-one. In the second stage, remember the second stage is pushing and delivery, and pushing can take hours. A lot, we've been trained to think that you just push once or twice and this baby comes out but pushing takes hours. And so we, um, as the nurse are at the bedside, helping her get into appropriate positions, changing that position frequently, helping her to be more comfortable. Typically the provider is not going to come to bedside until we are within a few pushes of delivery. All those hours of work are the nurse and the patient and her um, uh, support. And these are all the assessments that need to be done. The real trick of becoming a, a labor and delivery nurse is knowing when to call the provider during that pushing time. Here is the nursing management of the second stage, all the things that we're getting ready to do. And we're also charting all of this um, at the same time. And here are some different positions that we should be utilizing. It's not just flat on their back, knees up. We really need to be utilizing closed knee positioning, and lots of different movement in order to help that fetus navigate. Here's some great things that we can, do, uh, pushing positions we can do in the bed. This is called a squat bar. And then what are our interventions with birth? Well, we're there to help clean that area, assess for any complications. We're gonna document the whole process, really protecting the environment, making sure that everyone in the environment is doing well and handling the, the excitement of the moment. We also are responsible for initiate, initiating a neonatal resuscitation if necessary. We are assigning an APGAR score. We'll talk more about that when we get to that lecture. And we are identifying that baby, putting um, bands on to identify. When the placenta comes, we, um, it, depending on the facility, usually the provider will check the placenta for intactness and completeness. And then um, once the repair, if any, is made, we're going to take over the care of that pain management. ICE is their best friend, especially in the first 24 hours. Um, we might be, uh, depending on your facility again, doing an active management of second stage by administering oxytocin 
which is the synthetic or pitocin, synthetic version of oxytocin, were also now responsible for this new little human that just arrived and uh, doing the assessments and um, helping the uh, feeding, first feeding to happen. And then we are going to calculate a quantitative blood loss. Our assessments need to be every 15 minutes for the first two hours. And these are all the assessments that we're looking at. And these are the interventions that need to happen um, during that process. And this is just a sweet little reminder of why we're here and what it's all about. I hope you have enjoyed this lecture. If you have questions, reach out. Thanks for listening.